Good afternoon, everyone. We're just going to get started here. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Jesse Stolark, a policy associate at the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. Our topic this afternoon is farming and water quality conservation policies to reduce nutrient loss. Today, we will hear from five experts from the agricultural, water, and policy community to discuss this important topic. This is a very timely topic as water quality challenges have played out this year and in previous years in multiple regions of the country. Discussion of these issues in lo local and national media have raised the national consciousness on the challenges we face in providing clean and safe drinking water. At the same time, farmers have long understood the connections between nutrient management and water quality. In the Mississippi River Basin, farmers, stakeholders, and federal agencies continue to work to address this issue. Our speakers today will expand our understanding of what makes economic and environmental sense in conserving nutrients and explore what federal programs are helping farmers address nutrient management and water quality. I'll get a, we're going to start our, with our first speaker, who is Jonathan Coppice. Uh, Jonathan is currently a clinical assistant professor of law and policy at the University of Illinois, where he teaches and conducts research on a variety of agricultural policy topics. Prior to this position, Jonathan was chief counsel to the Senate Committee on Agriculture, Nutrition, and Forestry, where he helped to shape the current Farm Bill. Jonathan has also served as the administrator to the farm programs at USDA, and he started his career here on Capitol Hill as a staffer for Senator Ben Nelson of Nebraska. I'm going to turn the mic over to Jonathan. <clears throat> well, thank you, Jesse, and, and thank you to EESI for having us out for this uh, timely and, and important discussion. So I'm going to go through some just sort of basic uh, overview, entry, introductory type materials, and then we'll, uh, we'll dig deeper as we go. Of course, uh, with the University of Illinois, um, you know, we think about water quality challenges right now, the big issues, the big three. We look at the Gulf of Mexico hypoxia issue, uh, where you have nutrients in the Gulf of Mexico uh, resulting in the hypoxic or dead zone down there. Uh, of course, the Des Moines Water Works lawsuit has gotten a lot of attention uh, recently. And then uh, both the state of Iowa and the state of Illinois are working through nutrient loss reduction strategies at the state level to try to cut the amount of nutrients that get into the waterways and down to the Gulf. So these are the big issues. Of course, uh, and I apologize, the, the words are a little small on this, um, but the picture itself is probably worth a 1,000 words. If you talk about Gulf hypoxia, you look at that Mississippi River Basin, everything in green is farmland. This is not a small problem, and this is not something that can just be uh, easily addressed. So there's a lot of work to be done throughout here. We're, we're looking at nearly 41 percent of the contiguous United, United States and over 240 million acres of cropland. So this is a big topic, a big scope. Of course, Des Moines Water Works, um, we've been watching this one closely. Uh, it's a, it's a, a, a lawsuit that has been filed just this year, so we're still very much in the initial stages of this and, you know, Nobody yet knows how this is going to play out, but what we're seeing is, is what uh, is fairly, a fairly novel legal theory. You know, under the Clean Water Act, um, ag stormwater is exempted, so uh, what runs off the field, what comes off the field is exempted from uh, the Clean Water Act regulations as a, as a non-point source um, of, of pollution. Uh, Des Moines has filed a lawsuit claiming that um, the drainage districts, so many of our farms, when they drain, they drain into... Uh, districts, which is made up of the land and the landowners in the area, and they're claiming that uh, when that water comes out of the, the district level tile, that it's no longer qualifies under the exemption. This has the potential, and this has gotten a lot of attention because it has the potential to really change this conversation if we start looking at lawsuits on drainage districts, uh, particularly in states like Iowa and Illinois and Minnesota, where we have a lot of a lot of drainage and a lot of districts. Um, you know, they're alleging over four million dollars on nitrate removal equipment, so they're uh, alleging that the cost of the nitrates in the water they're having to clean out uh, at the drinking level um, or at the drinking water range. And then, of course, this nutrient loss reduction strategy. So the state of Illinois has moved forward with a strategy, uh, Iowa has done as well, to how do we work with farmers, with municipalities, with everybody in the, in the state to try and reduce the amount of nutrients that are getting into the water supply. Uh, with a goal right now, you see about a 15% nitrate reduction by 2025 and moving from there. And this is really looking at this, at this Gulf of Mexico hypoxia issue and how do we reduce what's happening. And of course, this is a, while on one hand a tough conversation, it's also a very uh, timely and important conversation for farmers because when you apply nutrients to your field, you do not want them to run off. They are important to fertilize crops and help you produce a crop. And so there's a lot of thinking that we can do 
a lot of work here to reduce that loss that both, both benefits the farmer at the farm level in the field, keeping those nutrients for the crop, and uh, as well as keeping, keeping them out of, out of the water supply and then eventually out of the Mississippi River and down to the Gulf of Mexico. You know, I mentioned Des Moines and some of the things that are going on. We look at a state like Illinois with about 9.7 million acres of tile drain land, so a huge undertaking just in the state of Illinois, as well as the entire Mississippi River Basin. And some of the estimates we've seen in the science assessment about what is being lost from these fields. And again, I think a lot of times uh, the importance of this conversation, we can, we can lose the, the discussion in lawsuits or the hypoxic zone and miss the point that, that farmers themselves uh, have a very strong motivation to, to keep those nutrients in the field and keep them for the crop. And so a lot of farmers and farm groups have been very active in trying to develop the strategy and find a way to work through these issues that uh, benefits them as well as our, our water supplies. And so a lot of work is going on, and this has caught a lot of attention, and it's gaining attention with farmers as we have these conversations around the state, throughout the region. And again, just looking at this, so if we, we go deeper into what has been a science-based strategy to try to find ways to reduce nutrient loss, to keep the nutrients in the soil, different, you know, different uh, components, different things like conservation-based practices. So everything from nitrific uh, nitrification inhibitors, right? Something I have with my, with my nitrogen when I put it on the field to hold it in that soil longer so it doesn't leach out. Everything down to bioreactors at the tile level and how much do they reduce the nutrient loss? How much are they holding in the soil, keeping out of the, out of the river? And then of course, what does it cost? Because these practices all come with a cost to the farmer, um, are all challenging to put in place in many respects. You know, we think of things like cover crops as a great example. There's a lot of talk right now about cover crops and how do you use them? How do you manage a cover crop? Um, you know, my dad farms in, in Ohio and, and has been experimenting with cover crops for many years and has had varying success. And you're managing something outside of your commercial crop. And so how do you do that? What uh, advice can we learn? What, what techniques can we learn? Because you do get a fairly significant amount of of nitrate reduction or you're holding that soil because that cover crop then is going to scavenge the nitrogen after the corn or soybean is harvested. And so these kind of practices are all being looked at, all being investigated and worked on, but they come with costs and they come with management challenges. They come with uh, the addition of risk for the farm, uh, particularly with something like cover crops. If, if you do not get that uh, terminated in time or dealt with in the spring, you're going to have a hard time planting your commercial crop. What does that mean for your farm's operation? How do you manage through that? So we see these, these, uh, these issues coming up, and we see a lot of work trying to sort this out for the farmer. And of course, I think this cost uh, aspect is a big, big part of this right now, uh, particularly as you see uh, margins coming down in a lower commodity price scenario for farmers. These cost uh, issues get magnified. And that's where conservation programs come in. So as we dive deeper into this, we think about the federal assistance that's in the Farm Bill that goes out to farmers to help them offset the cost of these programs, these practices. Uh, this is just looking at Illinois briefly of what we've been seeing the last couple of years in Illinois between uh, CSP and EQIP. So I've picked those two, the Conservation Security Program and the Environmental Quality Incentives Program. From a policy standpoint, we think of these two, these are our working lands conservation. So we're using these programs and these federal dollars to work into the farm practice, these conservation practices, into the farm's operation, as opposed to some of the more traditional conservation programs that will remove land from production. So if you go back and think uh, back through places like Illinois, where you see a lot of the red there is where we expect a lot of the tile drainage to be, that is incredibly productive farmland, that's incredibly expensive farmland, and the tile itself is an expense on the farmland and a value of the farmland. So you want to begin to think of these working lands policies because we're probably not going to take much of that, if any, out of, out of farming. And so it's important to think about how these policies have adjusted to try to deal with these on the ground, in field issues, and how can they be adjusted going forward to better target these type of challenges that we have. And as an example of that, and then I will get out of the way for the rest of the speakers, but one of the things that we've been working closely on with the Illinois Corn Growers, Illinois Farm Bureau, and many of the other farm organizations in the state of Illinois is this idea of looking at precision technology and basic farm business management. How do we combine the things that farmers do now for their commercial operation and adapt them or adjust them or, in, or use them for conservation? 
you know, basic things. We look at yield maps and how we look at soil and, and, and field elevation and hydrology and water movement. How do we begin to combine these things that farmers are doing? So what are the business management components of conservation? And we're working on a regional conservation partnership program proposal, uh, RCPP, which was in this most recent farm bill, to look at addressing these type of regional conservation challenges across multiple farms, trying to coordinate, trying to get a little innovative at the ground level to help farmers address some of these challenges. And we kind of think that the more we do this from a business management standpoint, the more we understand the economics of nutrient loss, the economics of conservation, and can take technology to help farmers manage through the complexity and the risk. Combine those issues, we will see, we think uh, we will see significant advancements on the ground, and we'll learn a lot about conservation, conservation policies, and how it works uh, in, in agriculture and for farmers. And so we're working through these issues uh, as we are, as today even, trying to find a the solutions that will help address these issues, address it in a way that makes sense for the farmer at the farm level, and reduce uh, the nutrients that get into the water. So with that, I will get out of the way with uh, that brief introduction and turn it over uh, to the experts on the panel. And I guess, Adam, now that you're here, we're going to pull you right in. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan, for an introduction to this complicated topic and how all these pieces start to fit together. Um, so next up, we're going to hear from Adam Sharp. Adam is the Vice President of Public Policy at the Ohio Farm Bureau. Prior to his role at the Farm Bureau, he served as Acting Counselor on Agricultural Policy to the Administrator of EPA, where he also served as Political Deputy over EPA's Pesticide Office. Prior to his positions at EPA, Adam was Director of Gov Government Relations for the American Farm Bureau Federation. Adam is also involved in his family's farm, located in Fairfield County, Ohio. I'm going to turn it over to Adam. Thank you. Let's see if we can get this to work here. All right. So I'm going to talk, Jonathan's presentation is perfect uh, lead-in to my discussion, uh, which is going to be very specific to on the ground level. So what we're doing in Ohio, very specific to... Uh, a unique problem for our state, but not necessarily unique uh, within uh, the Midwest or even across the country, but certainly the way we've gone about dealing with it. Uh, water quality in Ohio. When we're looking at our watersheds and how Ohio is laid out, southern two-thirds of our state drains south, right? Heads down the Mississippi. And, of course, nitrates and other discussions are part of, uh, part of what we're looking at. But the top third of our state drains north up into the Great Lakes. So just a little bit about Ohio. So... When we're talking about water quality in Ohio, this is what we're talking about predominantly. Now, we are talking nutrient management in general and certainly uh, with nitrogen and other issues, uh, but phosphorus runoff, specifically in the form of dissolved reactive phosphorus uh, that contributes to lakes turning green, uh, is our issue. Uh, now, our, our politicians uh, are very keen to this, obviously, uh, when they're running for office, both locally and nationally. Uh, they tend to not like the idea of having a green lake. Uh, they can't necessarily see the mouth of the Mississippi River. Uh, they do know there's issues, and they do know we need to do things, and we are doing things to deal with issues at the mouth in Mississippi. Uh, but right in our own backyard uh, is the issue that we're tackling with. So May of 2010, that top picture is Grand Lake St. Mary's. It's an inland lake in the western part of the state of Ohio. Uh, it was one of the first kind of indicators, if you will, wake up call for agriculture and for the state uh, that we do have some phosphorus issues in our state. And certainly a phenomenon uh, that's driving, uh, uh, driving these harmful algal bloom uh, issues across our state. Now you see all the stars. Those are all uh, lakes uh, that are very diverse in nature uh, that have had this same problem. Uh, so not always just uh, a lake like Grand Lake, which is heavy agriculture, but a number of these lakes down across the southeastern part of the state are in Appalachia. Not a lot of agriculture where that's actually happening. The, southern, the, the next two pictures, that's Toledo's water intake. That's a glass of water there next to the intake. Uh, and the last picture, of course, is, is Lake Erie, and that was a, a cover shot of National Geographic. So it is a statewide issue for our state, not just Western Lake Erie Basin and Lake Erie, which is what's getting most of the focus because of, of what happened in Toledo. We're talking about cyanobacteria. It's a blue-green algae. Well, they call it a blue-green algae. It's actually a bacteria. Uh, so it does have, of course, uh, some harmful effects uh, depending on the type of exposure. Our TAC in Ohio has been both mandatory and voluntary. Uh, there has been several mandatory actions taken uh, that agriculture has been very involved in, as well as a number of voluntary actions. So what I'm going to do is just highlight several of those for you here as, as my presentation. 
First, Senate Bill 1. Uh, this was a bill that we passed in our state legislature. It wasn't driven by agriculture originally, uh, but we got on board and we, and we absolutely supported the bill, supported its passage, to, as we made sure it was going to work for agriculture. What it does is specifically, it's about 24 parts of 24 counties in the northwestern part of our state, where it does restrict uh, the application of nutrients, both manure or commercial fertilizer, to frozen or snow-covered ground or saturated ground or potentially saturated ground. Uh, so that's the extent of that legislation. It is just now coming into fruition. Uh, and really, uh, as this winter moves forward, uh, we'll have the rule package out, and it'll be, uh, be starting to be enforced for some operators this winter uh, and then others over the next two winters, depending on the size of your operation. Senate Bill 150 is the first of its kind in the country where it does require certification to apply commercial fertilizer anywhere in our state. Uh, so any farmer who's going to apply fertilizer on more than 50 acres uh, has to go through this certification process, state law. Again, both these bills were bills that when they were initially being discussed, you can imagine agriculture's response was of, of, <laughs> of mixed emotion. Uh, but as we got involved with these pieces of legislation and moved them forward and found ways to make sure that it was going to work for farmers as well, uh, there was support across the board from our agricultural groups uh, to make sure that we could uh, support these bills and ultimately pass both these pieces of legislation. In fact, you see the card on the bottom. Uh, we, we've, we've certified now over 6,000 farmers. Many of those focused this first year in the Western Lake Erie Basin. Uh, but we've really focused Farm Bureau on actually getting folks to certify even quicker. It's a three-year time frame to get certified. We're pushing hard to get everybody certified here within the, net, within the first year or two, uh, and we're well on our way toward doing that. So backing up a little bit, 2011 and 12, following Grand Lake, uh, one of the things that we did, and I'm going I'm I'm to slide through a, a series of actions here on the voluntary side that go hand in hand and fra in fact are pushing and leading the, the mandatory actions that we've taken. What we did as agriculture groups, a very diverse group of agricultural organizations and others, including our Soil and Water Conservation Districts, our Ohio State University and others, uh, led by first saying to our farmers, to ourselves, we expect you to do the right thing. We expect you to use 4R nutrient management. We expect you uh, to, to be leaders in dealing with nutrient management. And in fact, even some of our county farm bureaus next to Grand Lake St. Mary's told some of our members, if you don't comply with what's being required of you in this, in this lake, we may actually consider booting you out of the organization. Uh, so, which is something that you don't hear often in, in, in any organization, right? Throwing people out. Uh, but that was the expectation. It was set very high. This letter laid that groundwork. We then put in a million dollars of farm, just Farm Bureau's uh, dollars. Now, corn and soy and the other groups also put in a very significant amount of money as well to do work that we saw as important on the voluntary side. So we, we approved and we've spent a million bucks. We actually just approved again last week another million uh, from our organization, which is enormous when you look at our operating budget. Uh, it is a large investment on the private side, private investment, if you will, from our Farm Bureau members across our state to do what's right for water quality. So what are those things? First, voluntary coordination with our Ohio State University. We're putting a lot of dollars straight into the university to help hire staff to do the fertilizer implementation, uh, the fertilizer certification implementation. That task has been taken from the state government. They asked the Ohio State University in contract to conduct the certification trainings, and they're the ones who are doing it. Uh, that said, they don't have enough resources to do all that. So we've actually stepped in with our own money to help make sure that happens in a very timely manner. But we're also doing all kinds of other things like updating our soil fertility recommendations. Uh, we're, we're exploring a whole series of projects, and a number of them are actually in the works. I'll hit on a couple of the big ones. One of the biggest uh, corn and soy in our Ohio Agribusiness Association and Farm Bureau uh, have, have led a, a, a very strong effort, coordination with USDA and with OSU, uh, to do this several million dollar study that looks at uh, runoff from our fields, both surface and subsurface. Everybody says, well, you can research this to death. And that's right, you could. But we also know that things have changed dramatically in agriculture over the last 20 years. Things have changed in our environment. Uh, things have also changed dramatically of what's moving off of our urban landscapes and from our wastewater treatment facilities, from our drinking water facilities and how they manage water. A lot has changed. So we needed to make sure we we're looking at specifically what's happening with surface and subsurface drainage in our farms given changes of practices. We've ripped out fence lines. Uh, we don't have as much, uh, you know, we, don't, we, uh, we have much more tile now. We're putting in more tile. We have bigger fields. We have bigger equipment. Things have changed dramatically of how we're managing our fields and our operations. And we need to make sure we had good, accurate data of what's actually happening in the field so that we know when we're making recommendations, we know it's going to actually work. Uh, conservation tillage is a terrific example of that. Uh, and also setting aside ground, but also in particular uh, when we're talking about no-till. 
Uh, what is the effect of no-till? Uh, there's a lot of good that's come from no-till. Some folks are quick to judge and say, well, gosh, maybe no-till is a big contributor to this issue. Well, how? In what ways? Because, in fact, there's probably a lot of benefits we can understand by both looking at no-till practices mixed with even other additional practices. So a lot that we, we have to learn. This is a six-year study. We're three years in. We have already from some very good data. Nutrient Management Project, we've put several hundred thousand dollars into hiring four individuals to specifically work with farmers in the northwestern part of our state to do nothing but write nutrient management plans for farmers. Uh, so this is just getting off the ground. We got the four folks hired and in place, and they're starting their work right now. The guy on the right, Don Ralph, that is the name of his boat, the farmer. Uh, he is one of our larger farmers in the northwestern part of our state, and he, as you could tell, is a big fan of fishing on Lake Erie. And frankly, he's telling people, I'm going to fix this problem. We farmers are going to take care of our part of this issue. Now, we know there's other parts, right? We can't do it all because there are certainly other contributors to this problem, not just agriculture. But for our part, we're going to take care of it. So Don's very engaged. Voluntary, RCPP. Jonathan already mentioned the RCPP, the Regional Conservation Partnership Program. It's a new farm bill program. Uh, we're one of the, those first block of states to receive this, uh, uh, this program's dollars. $17.5 million between Ohio, Indiana, and Michigan. Uh, there's a lot of wrinkles with this program. One, we're very excited about it. The first sign-up went like gangbusters. We actually could have given out every single penny in the very first sign-up back in July. Uh, but instead, it's, it's going to be managed over a couple-year period uh, just because of sh it's sheer weight of volume of the applications and moving through the process. So terrific response from the farmers. But on the management side for the state there's in, there's in, and with, uh, within RCS, uh, there's things we got to keep working out. Demonstration Farm, another project we're very excited about. Wisconsin's the first one to do a demonstration farm uh, series in, in their state. We're the second one. We're, ours is just getting off the ground now. Theirs has been in place for a couple years. Uh, this is a, a combined project uh, where NRCS and Farm Bureau were putting in together uh, over a million dollars into this project on it, just in itself. Uh, to set up a series of demonstration sites for a whole series of practices and research on conservation, everything from conservation management, nutrient management, et cetera, in, right in the heart of the Western Lake Erie Basin. Uh, we hired our full-time manager to run this, to run this program uh, just a couple months ago. Uh, we had about eight months of dealing with NRCS, and they've been great partners, but, you know, there's a lot to do with those contracts, so we got to sort it sorted out, and it's and it's moving along really well right now. We have a number of landowners who've already said, farmers, who said, uh, we want to volunteer and be part of this. So we're working through this demonstration farm project. Voluntary road trip. We took 100 of our farmers from all over the state. We took them to Lake Erie. We put them on lab boats. We took them out in the middle of the lake. We pulled water samples. We looked to see what was happening in the lake. And we made sure that they know, understand very well what's happening. They were excited to do it. They were excited to see it. And frankly, I was surprised at how many of them had not been out in the lake. Uh, especially from other parts of the state. So we took folks up and we got out there. We, we let them see what's happening. We let them ask questions. We went out with the scientists, with university folks, and we had terrific discussion. And ultimately what happened to this was policy development. Our farmers have set, I believe, some of the most, some of the most progressive water quality policy of any farm organization in the country. County programs. We know we don't have all the answers, so we put out a block, a, a series of grants. And we said to our county farm bureaus, if you guys can find projects that are going to benefit water quality, uh, we're going to incentivize you to do so. But you've got to come up with 60% of the funding on your own. And we're also looking for a lot of partners. These guys, in six months, uh, had enormous amount of projects lined up. We funded a dozen of them, spent all the money that we had. Uh, it, tenfold, uh, they galvanized on the, on the cost share side from other entities. And some of the things they did, I can't talk about all 12 today, but you can see this technology out here. A lot of work that we're doing in Ohio about how can you apply manure to growing crops at later stages so that you reduce the, the impact and potential for runoff. So new equipment that we've been testing and working on, we helped sponsor a lot of that work here this past year, but also something simple such as a phone app that is specifically designed for our farmers to be able to comply with Senate Bill 1 and Senate Bill 150. So the requirements that are in Senate Bill 1 and Senate Bill 150, we've put into an app uh, for farmers to download and use specifically so that they, it, it will also tell them right on their phone, it, right now in, in it's GPS located, right now in this field, is a, it, it, you're fine by those laws to apply manure, to apply fertilizer. It tells you right on your phone that you're clear. You punch it, you get your weather data recorded, you get your conditions recorded, everything's right there. This is free to farmers. We did it with our money, with a grant, with with. Our county farm bureau, Knox County Farm Bureau, who just received a national recognition for this in conjunction with the Soil and Water Conservation Districts. So a great project, and we're very happy to have it move forward. There's all kinds of additional voluntary projects uh, uh, that, are, that we're working on, including just educational displays around at all of our farm shows. Uh, any place farmers are getting together, we're putting information out there. Uh, we appreciate the work of uh, the Fertilizer Institute and in sponsoring uh, with us. 
uh, this, this project and some of these displays. We're also working on getting lower interest loans for farmers who are investing in nutrient management. We actually secured that through our state government. Uh, so you actually can knock off a percent or two off your loan rate if you're going for a conservation practice or equipment that'll help you in conservation. Media campaign, we're making sure we're telling folks what we're doing. Uh, so we're very, we're very proud of what we're doing, but we know we have to do more. Uh, so part of that discussion is, is a dialogue with the public, talking about what we're doing. And in fact, we hosted this uh, uh, media event up in Toledo, Food Dialogues. Sitting next to me to the left is the head of tourism for the city of Toledo. The next guy over is the head of the water treatment plant for Toledo. The next lady over is the head environmentalist in the northwestern part of our state. So we're sitting down with the people who matter, uh, the folks who are directly impacted. And of course, we're directly impacted and we're having good positive discussions. We're moving forward together. This is my last uh, couple slides here. Healthy Water Ohio, this is the biggest voluntary project we're doing. What we've seen is a lot of states put together good programs of how they want to nu do nutrient management. But the big problem we always hear is there's no money. There's no money to fund these things. So what are we going to do about that? So we got together a whole group of folks, everybody from Anheuser-Busch to the League of Conservation Voters to the Nature Conservancy to Environmental Defense Fund to Farm Bureau, Scott's miracle Grow, all the ag commodities, farm credit, our health uh, uh, our health commissioners, Lake Erie Shores and Islands, that's our tourism board for Lake Erie. And we said, how are we going to work on this? What are we going to do to fund these projects that we need to do to better our water quality? And what we came up with uh, was a proposal to create a state trust and a state bond focused just on water quality. Um, so we've been pushing that now. We're talking to legislators, and I feel very positive about passing this as a bonding measure in our state so the entire public, so we can all help uh, achieve our water quality goals. So why are we doing this? Uh, why such a progressive approach in Ohio? We think it's the right thing to do. We also need to know that we have to do our part for agriculture. We also know that there are federal laws we have to deal with. There's also a series of lawsuits, state politics, right? T tends to be a, some governor of ours tends to be running for higher office. We'll see how that goes. Uh, and in a state, we do have 40% reduction goals in Lake Erie for phosphorus. Um, I don't just preach this stuff. I do it on my farm. I farm full time. As, um, I farm full time, and according to my full time job at Farm Bureau, because that's how it feels, uh, of putting nutrient management practices in place on our farm. These are my kids enjoying water quality. We've won a series of environmental awards on our farm. For the first time on our farm, we have we have uh, all of our crop acres are either under cover crop uh, or under a small grain this year, which I'm very proud of. But as Jonathan said, it ain't easy. Uh, we farm a couple hours east of where his, his dad farms, uh, and it's not easy. It's time-consuming. It's costly. It takes a lot of work uh, to, do, to deal with cover crops, and you're not always sure what the benefit is, uh, but we have to move in those directions and talk about these things and explore these areas. So I'm doing it on my farm, too, and not just talking about it in the policy realm. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adam. It's uh, great to see not only what you're doing on your own farm, but to see all the voluntary and mandatory measures that are being taken in your state in Ohio. And next we're gonna move and talk more about the farm. Uh, Len Corzine is gonna talk about the practical side, what farmers are doing. Len is a fifth generation farmer from, the, from Assumption, Illinois, where he farms corn and soy and raises his Angus cows with his wife and son. Previously, Len served as the president of both the National Corn Growers Association and the Illinois Corn Growers Association. He has helped shape both biotech policy and the renewable fuel standard during his tenure with the Corn Growers Association. Len has received numerous awards for his work on biotechnology, renewable energy, and farm conservation, and serves as an advisor on these issues to numerous organizations. Len? Thank you very much. Uh, certainly appreciate the opportunity to come to a meeting like this and, and applaud EESI for having me so that, so that you can talk directly to farmers because we want to work through these issues, but you need the farmer input into that. So I'll try and do that a little bit today. I want to show you a little bit our, uh, about who is on that farm and what we're doing, what my son and my wife and I are trying to do on our farm. This first slide is uh, kind of a fun shot because it shows uh, the increased productivity that we've had that is really, truly amazing the past few years. And the issue right here is we can't get it away from the combine quick enough. And that's my son standing uh, right up there. And he's not real happy because dad's not back with the truck, so he ran it over. Um, this is my wife and I. And we grew from uh, being uh, married. We both grew up in Assumption to three kids, and Craig, the big guy there, is the one that uh, helps direct things on the farm, actually more than I do, and somehow grew into this big gang that we have a lot of fun with, and, and these, this is important for you to see because this is the family that is on the farm. 
breathing the air, drinking the water, playing in the dirt. So these things we're talking about are important to us because what can be more important? That's the issue. So we're working hard on that and, you, and, I, and I want to try and help convey that. We're also what we call a heritage farm. Uh, my family uh, moved my ancestors and landed in Assumption, Illinois about 140 years ago. So uh, I think a lot of the states have century farms and things. So that's what we have there. This is uh, in off season a little bit because otherwise when we're in season and harvest and uh, planting time, we don't, we don't get to take a break when, we're, uh, when there's any sun shining. And so here though, the, Craig and I are kind of relaxing, having a drink and talking about the future and what we're gonna do tomorrow, next month, next season. And the mantra that we have on our farm is, is leaving the farm better than we found it. And I think that's really important to explore new technologies, new things you can do, and how do we continue to make that kind of improvement. Sustainability or sustainable development, you know that word, we all have our own definition for it and there are multiple definitions, but I like to talk about sustainable development. And I hope you can read it because it's development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And that talks about the future and, and where, what, it, what is the landscape, what's our farm going to look like for that next generation. So what is sustainability? One of the things that is key in what we try to do to be a sustainable farm, and, and you include the word stewards of that, to be stewards of our farm, is decreasing soil erosion, erosion and increasing efficiency with responsible use of pesticides, fertilizers, and fuel. And with that, yields continue to increase, which means profitability and productivity needs to increase and, that, and economics are, always need to be part of the discussion about sustainability. So how do we do that? How do we make this all work? So Craig and I talk a lot about, and Yellow doesn't show about, but new market opportunities because in my part of the world we grow corn soybeans. We don't have any irrigation, which is a good thing uh, for us or it's a, a savings to us with natural water. But there are various contracts for everything from uh, different classes of corn. There's yellow corn that we grow mostly, but there's white corn, there's food grade corns. We do a lot of seed production, and so we can segregate a lot of things, and uh, so we take a look at those. But also included, we explore new technologies. So how do we make a determination, and whether it's a seed technology, whether it's an equipment technology, but these tools that are going to help us Number one, is it safe? Is it going to make us safer? Number two, is it, is it an improvement? Is it an improvement from what we're doing currently? Is it an improvement for the environment? Is it an improvement for the farm? Is it an improvement for our customer? And we never lose sight of who our customer is, which in the end of the day is you all. So does it make economic sense? And I touched on that because we can come up with some of the best things in the world, but you know, if, if, if we lose money in the deal, we aren't very sustainable at the end of the day because we have to be able to be profitable at the end of the day, just like any other business. So another thing back to the customer, will we deliver a higher quality product for our customer at the end of that day? One of the things that we do with that higher quality product, we have to talk a moment about GMOs because we do deliver a higher quality product using that tool because we don't have the insect damage that we once had. We had whether it's for food use or whether it's for feed use for our livestock, their insect damage is when you start getting mycotoxins and aflatoxins which are damaging to all of us. So the GMOs really do prevent that. We have a higher quality product. So I show this picture because those are some of our cows and that's one of the granddaughters and it's just a really cute picture. But an important thing to remember is not one animal or one person has gotten sick or died from a GMO after 20 years of, of use of these products. I show this back to the equipment technology and tools we have. This 4020 is special to me because my dad bought it in 1968, which I'm showing my age was about the time I graduated from high school. And it was a leading edge technology of the day. It had a power shift transmission that you could shift gears without using the clutch, which was awesome. A lot of neat stuff on that tractor. But we have evolved to this. Back in that other era, we were still plowing the soil, uh, covering all the residue. And you can see from this photo, the residue that's on top of the ground, and actually we've improved from this photo, but this also shows this particular planter that we've replaced. These small boxes about here are for insecticide. 
Insecticide is the most toxic chemical that we use, and that was our only way to control corn rootworm. And the guy in the tractor had to handle it. And the guy in the tractor now is my son, and I don't want him having to handle that. So with technologies, with biotechnology, we're controlling that pest without that chemical. So we've completely eliminated a class of chemicals. And this new planter, it's the same size, a couple things different, but the main difference, no insecticide boxes. So we have completely eliminated a very toxic class of, of chemicals that's toxic not only to the user, but also to the person uh, that might be buying it from us. There's no residue that we have to worry about, and you're not, we're not putting that into the soil either. This is another photo that shows the, the tractor, uh, give you an idea of the equipment we're using today and the technology because this is, this is a receiver that, uh, for uh, global positioning as well as there's a radio uh, uh, receiver to make it even more accurate. We can go right in and we, we are site specific and that gives us geo positions. It also makes sure our rows are stay straight which are pretty but also make us more efficient. And the result of this, and using technologies, and this is an important slide, and try to remember this one. Now, um, in 30 years, this is what we've been able to do, and this is what, this is the amount of these elements that it takes to produce a bushel of corn. So we have lowered the amount of land that it takes by 30%, and the important thing here is that now to provide for the needs of society or our customer base, we don't have to uh, encroach on those fragile lands. As demands grow, we're able to do more on our ground. The soil loss that I talked about has gone down by two-thirds. That's pretty phenomenal if we've been able to reduce soil loss by those amounts. Irrigation water use per bushel is 53%, which speaks a lot to what the new hybrids do, but as I mentioned in our own particular case, we, we use rainfall anyway. So um, the energy, amount of energy, which uh, we don't till the soil near as much as we used to, we're, so we're talking about less diesel fuel use per bushel of corn. Uh, the equipment we use today, we may work the ground about two times, and when we do that, we only use maybe a half a gallon of fuel per acre, where we used to use a couple gallons. And some of the other systems, they do use more fuel, which is important as far as greenhouse gas emissions. So this is on our farm. This slide kind of shows uh, we track uh, the, the, the nitrogen amount that we, we apply and then the, our corn yield starting in 1980. Now, we have a nice line going. We're making improvement. And then look what happens. And somebody asked me, actually, what happened? Did you just make a, a mistake putting your data in? And no. And I said that what's important to remember is when we're talking about programs and trying to have strict protocols or rules, we're working with something that we can't control every year, and that's Mother Nature. And you know what? Rainfall, uh, weather conditions can throw us a curve, and it certainly did in, th in these three years, but look how we bounced right back up. And that's the important thing to remember because we went way off the charts last year, 2015, we're coming back a little bit. But that's an important to re remember when we're looking at, at setting up the rules for some of these things. We have to have flexibility built in. So this is uh, a nice harvest picture and this is how we do it. And see that global positioning is on there because that's our big data collector. Every three seconds that records how many bushels of corn or soybeans that we have uh, produced and it puts it on a, on a map for us, uh, establishes that not only in the combine, but sends it back to our office computer, or in these days also onto the iPad, right? And it's a great management tool for us to take a look at, at problems we have when we look at what, what could be the problem. Could it be a drainage issue, a nutrient issue? And it helps us also with writing prescriptions, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a moment. This is all important because we've got this next generation, like I mentioned before, that they're really interested in the farm and they love riding on the tractor and the combine, but it's kind of like a lot of you may have your kids. You ever have one of your little ones that the best way to put them to sleep is put them in the car and drive around the block a couple times, right? Well, they spend a half an hour in the combine. I mean, it goes to this generation, it goes clear back to when my son was riding and sitting on a bucket. They have these now. So they still go to sleep. So where do we go from here? From here, we are looking at nutrient management. In fact, we're doing this today. 
Split applications of nitrogen, we make three applications on our farm. We, we, in our system, agronomically, it's good to get some nitrogen on in the fall of the year, but we've really reduced that amount with, and using a stabilizer to help with the, uh, with the soil mi microbial activity. Then in the spring, we make an application uh, just ahead of planting, and then we do a side dress application. And so with that site-specific sp application, we do that with uh, writing prescriptions. So each field, we have a prescription, and the equipment that we've invested in will adjust that on the go using the satellites, using positioning, and it will change the rates of seeding rates. It will change the rates of, uh, of what we're doing with nutrients. So the big deal here is we are getting much more efficient in utilizing our nutrients. We may not always be reducing them per field, but we're getting more efficient, and that's what, uh, what is important. Seeds are included in that because, whoops, because... The genetics and biotechnology make a better plant. And when you get a better plant, you get better roots, you get better stalks, so they're able to utilize that nutrient. So that's part of what we're talking about here, too. You've got to get that nutrient from the ground, from the soil, up into the end product, which in this case is corn or soybeans or, or any other product. And biotechnology is part of that answer because it protects the potential of the seed genetics. And, and we have more choices than we've ever had. And that continues to improve because of, of what the, that science and what the seed industry is doing for us. So I already touched on uh, the reduced tillage that we're doing, and we continue to get improvements in seed placement with doing less tillage. Some are complete no-till. We're a reduced till and looking at continuing to move forward in that area. Uh, the field... Prescriptions I touched on and that better utilization. Another thing we're using, uh, I have a nephew that has one, are use of drones to help us with uh, part of, of being efficient and doing uh, uh, what needs to be done in the summertime. When you get a crop that's taller than me, it's hard to go a half a mile through and see what's going on. So drone technology and uh, imaging is really playing a big, a big part of that. There's a lot of potential there. i got to speak a moment about partnerships because that's what this is about as well. But the partnerships that we're doing with folks like uh, Environmental Defense Fund, with the Walton Foundation, national and, and state corn growers, and even folks like a number of your organizations here, we can come up with answers, we think, in our own silos. But you know, that really doesn't get us to a solution very quickly. We need to all get out of our silos and work together, and that's what these partnerships do. And that's why that's really important. And just like initially some groups were looking at nutrient reduction. Well, you don't just look at nutrient reduction because you can get things out of balance agronomically. When you get out of balance, why well, then you actually go backwards. So you need, you need nutrient loss reduction. So keep that in mind. The word loss needs, needs to happen and, and be part of that. So with that, I'll finish. The voluntary depart, uh, part we all know about and we've got things that work the other folks have talked about. So thank you again. This is kind of the sunset of, of of where we have been and the sunrise, you can use it as a sunrise of where we're headed and, and we're gonna to work conti to continue improving our farm. Thank you very much. Thanks, Len. It's, it's so interesting to hear about all the tech advancements and how you're implementing them on the farm. Um, when I was in Iowa this summer actually and that was the topic du jour, which was uh, how big data is really driving a lot of the advancements in agriculture. So next we're going to switch gears a little bit and we're going to hear from Tariq Balak. Tariq, Tariq is the water, water utility plant manager at the city of Cedar Rapids, Iowa. At the water utility, Tariq is active in the Middle Cedar Partnership Project, a collaboration between the water utility agricultural producers. Tariq has been working with the water utility since 1989, and he has worked in both drinking water and wastewater systems. Tariq? Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Tariq. Uh, and <clears throat> I was a, a farming state. It's an agricultural state. Um, not a big surprise, correct? Uh, if you look here, this is the Cedar River watershed, and that blue area right there is our project area. So my heroes here today are uh, Adam, which I haven't met yet. Adam, nice to meet you. <laughs> and Len. Um, these are the leaders of, of these collaborations and of these activities. And 
really what they're interested in is good, good production, uh, keeping their soil on their land. And, but soil, soil is much bigger than that as well. Uh, it's a healthy environment, uh, helps uh, farmers in Iowa, uh, cleaner water. And this is different for a drinking water professional to really talk about. We talk about water quality. And uh, we're, we're trying to change our, our mindset and our, our frame of thinking to address uh, or, or talk in conversations that are meaningful for our, our partners. This is a 2015 map of the critical conservation areas. And if you take note of the Cedar or the Mississippi River Basin here, it actually expands out to the Rockies here up into Canada. Um, about a million uh, plus acres of watershed and drainage. So that's uh, pretty, pretty expansive. And these are the high priority watersheds and we're gonna drill down into where we are in the middle cedar with, uh, with what uh, I, or Cedar Rapids is involved in. Uh, we mentioned that the Iowa Nutrient Reduction Strategy was one of the, uh, the key things that came out of the Hypoxia Tax Task Force. Um, the first draft was uh, developed in 2011 and updated in 2014. It's really science and technology based. Um, there's point source and non-point source uh, information. The uh, Iowa Water Environment Association, the League of Cities, and Iowa Association of Business Industries really help to help define what that point source uh, contribution is in terms of the strategy. And the non-point um, USDA NRCS, the USDA Ag Research, as well as the DNR, the Department of Ag and Land Stewardship in Iowa, and Iowa State University. Iowa State University really was a, a very a key player in developing the strategy. But from a local perspective, you know, for Cedar Rapids, Cedar Rapids is a, a community of about 120,000 people. We have about 50,000 plus metered service accounts. And, um, but the driving factors for us, and we'll go into the flood impact here shortly, but it's uh, water, water retention, okay? And the contaminants, it's a water quality. And flood impact is, is, is completely, uh, uh, in, in terms of health and welfare, uh, in, in industry and economy in our area, and you'll see why. This is a, a picture of our 31-foot uh, uh, stage flood in 2008. This is downtown Cedar Rapids. And within that downtown area, that flood-affected area, you can see a lot of these um, names up here on the, on the slide here. They're just the industry piece of it. So why is that significant? Okay, yeah, we're, we're doing a lot to, uh, in terms of flood mitigation. But I wanted to point out that some of our, our key service or our metered accounts are big industry. And, you know, that's uh, uh, vital to the economic uh, development and growth of, of our community as well as our region. Let me go back to this slide here. The USGS is also a partner with Cedar Rapids in terms of water quality monitoring. And for the last, um, well, since the late 90s, the USGS has been doing uh, water quality testing throughout the Cedar River area. And uh, as you can see, in this period here, we went through a drought in Cedar Rapids. And that following year, when we had a, a wet year, the Cedar River uh, spiked up dramatically with its concentration of nitrates. And that nitrate uh, that's in the river um, even though it's attenuated when it gets into our water source, it still is an elevated amount, which our, our plants are not capable of treating. We do, Cedar Rapids does not have a method to remove nitrates, unlike Des Moines. So we're really relying on 
uh, close monitoring and doing some, in terms of balance, balancing our, our wells that are lower in nitrates with other wells that you know, will shut off wells that have high nitrates. That's the only method that we have in terms of how we uh, put out that, that uh, good drinking water from, uh, from our water source. As you can see here, the trend is, is slightly climbing in the Cedar River. This uh, image right here is a nitrate monitor. It's an online monitor. It's uh, running 24 hours a day. Um, this was taken in June. So as you can see, 5.9 is, is pretty high. Um, 10 is the, the, the max level. Okay, so we're, we're approaching that. And we see that in the spring and the fall time periods. We see an elevated amount uh, coming through our plant. But the cumulative impact in terms of our, 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 our project is, uh, you know, food processing. 100,000 bushels a day of soybeans come through Cedar Rapids, or come to Cedar Rapids. A million bushels a day of corn are processed and used every day. It's a vital part of our economy. More importantly, consumer safety and health. And, you know, we, uh, we have to think beyond our borders. We have to look upstream as well as being mindful of our downstream communities uh, in terms of what, what the city and the, the, our wastewater plant is contributing to this, um, to the environment. I like this slide, partnering, okay? Steve Hirschner, my boss, uh, sitting in the audience, when Steve said a year ago uh, to our small group, said, let's, let's put in an application for this. Are you guys up for it? And uh, we were all kind of scratching our temples like this. And we knew that meant a lot of work, but it's actually been a good ride. It's been a lot of fun. And it was about a year ago this time that Cedar Rapids was informed that we could go ahead and submit that full proposal. That meant, you know, we were one of uh, a couple hundred uh, applicants that were sitting good to be approved. We we're excited at that point. NRCS puts in a couple million dollars. Our partner group, a pretty diverse group, putting in about 2.3 million, primarily of technical assistance. That leaves about 4.3 total that's available for our watershed in terms of contribution and working with the lens and the atoms of our communities. And uh, it's been just a, an unusual and really positive experience. So the clock started June 5th. And we're at almost the end of the year here. Um, we've worked on developing some, um, some aspect of our, our five-year project, which is, uh, and actually I'll get into that here in just a bit. But the approach we're using, improving soil health, that's what farmers like to talk about. Water quality, that's what prof water professionals love to talk about and water quantity, okay? Yes, you know, if we had another rain event and a series of, of uh, different uh, environmental situations that led to a 31-foot flood stage, healthy soil will help retain the water, but you know, who knows? We're, we're gonna get, uh, we're gonna have floods in Cedar Rapids again. We're hopeful that it won't be as high as it was back in 2008. So working together, that's our approach. But we're expanding on a good thing. The RCPP, or the Middle Cedar Partnership Project, project um, is a new thing for us, but we're building on something that was already on the ground with two other demonstration projects. One is the Miller Creek Water Quality Initiative, and the other is the Benton Tama County uh, Nutrient Reduction Demonstration Project. And this is what that project area looks like. And this yellow, uh, yellow area here, it's primarily cover crops. Now, that's what the plan looks like. So in our, in our proposal, we said three objectives. Objective number one, develop a watershed plan. Objective two, based on those plans, determine what the best management practices are for those areas. And objective three, reach out and educate communicate. Pretty simplistic approach.
This is near Laporte City, which is about an hour from Cedar Rapids. So as you can see, we're well beyond our corporate limits. Um, this is a, uh, a group of people that are installing a bioreactor. A lot of wood chips, big hole in the ground. But it's all connected to a tile system that's uh, doing its best to capture any, any nutrients that are flowing through that tile system. And uh, those, the bioreactor is, in, ter in essence, reducing the amount of uh, nitrogen and phosphorus going into, into the waterway. There's Steve right here. This bioreactor bio costs about 20,000 bucks to put in. It takes about three days to install. And cover crops. Uh, on this particular field, the cover crops that were here, um, what I was told was the farmer did not have to use any weed control, and that the cover crop actually did a, an effective job of, of not, allowing, not allowing weeds to grow within the cash crop there, soybeans. Again, an illustration of what our practice area look, or what the uh, watershed area looks like here. And we have a, a wide suite of practices uh, from cover crops to bioreactors, prairie strips, wetlands. Part of our objective three, which is outreach and education. Um, the city of Cedar Rapids team is learning a lot by going to the field days, talking with the farmers out there that are, that are hosting these, these uh, activities. And uh, it's just it's a thrill to be involved. My hope, though, is to get more individuals, the farmers in our area, to step up and be the leaders and take charge of these activities rather than uh, a group of uh, agencies coming in to try and get them to come along. You follow that? So this is the list of partners. And each of them is excited about this next five years because we're going to see some positive results. But as you can see, thanks again to the NRCS, we're able to put this group of partners together but as you can see, farmers and, pro and producers, they are really the, the important partner in this. They're going to make uh, the changes on their land. They're going to uh, realize the benefits of their hard work, whether it's uh, uh, profits or soil retention or water quality. All of those things they can realize by having our farmers be the leaders. And the soil and conservation districts, very important uh, personnel there. Um, we work with them. They're part of the NRCS within the community, and uh, they've been doing this work for a long time. Conservation plan. Let's start with the conservation plan and understand what you're doing, understanding when you're going to apply your chemical and how much and when. And... Jesse, thanks for inviting us here to uh, speak with this group. Thanks, Tarek. Um, it's a very interesting discussion. And we're going to wrap up here with uh, John Larson. John is the executive director of the American Farmland Trust. American Farmland Trust is a nonprofit organization that advocates for voluntary conservation practices and programs that preserve land, soil, and water supplies. American Farmland Trust estimates that its efforts have helped conserve 5 million acres of farmland nationwide. Prior to joining AFT, John served as the chief executive officer of the National Association of Conservation Districts. John also owned and operated his, his own family farm in Royal City, Washington. John? Thanks, Jesse. Well, I'm going to try and put a bow on this. Uh, 
when, when we look at the intersection of how we provide a stable food supply for not only our citizens, but also for the 9 billion people that are going inhabit to inhabit the planet in 2050, we also need to look at protecting our natural resources. And one of the most important and compelling challenges as we face as a country is water quality. Um, let us not forget that uh, Dr. Norman Borlaug predicted to feed 9 billion will require us to produce as much food in the next 40 years as we have in the past 10,000 years combined. So with that in mind, keeping agricultural land productive and in production will be critical not only to meeting the food demands but also protecting the health and resilience of our environment. To keep that land in production is critical since we first came to this country more than 400 years ago, 114 million acres in the lower 48 states and Hawaii have been developed. American Farmland Trust is very concerned about this trend of taking that base natural resource issue where all these other practices get implemented and making sure we're thinking about that because this means that 30%, 37% of the land developed in the United States over the past 400 plus years was developed in the last 30. So, as we must do while meeting our environmental challenges, we must do it in a way that also is impacted by an erratic climate. 31 feet, that's a lot. I don't think there's a levee that can be built that uh, takes care of 31 feet. Um, water quality is one such, such issue that becomes a part of the national conversation. We've already talked about algal blooms in Lake Erie. We've talked about the Des Moines Water Works lawsuit. We've, we've looked at all these different issues around Mississippi River Basin and the hypoxia zone. For farmers, there is a real possibility of a regulatory framework being thrust upon them in these regions, highlighting the need for effective, voluntary, incentive-based conservation on privately owned farmland, ranch land, and forest land. In the United States, 70% of land is owned by private individuals with that majority of that land devoted to agriculture. The development, let's say the maturation of the Farm Bill conservation programs is an ongoing process. The current suite of Farm Bill conservation programs is far different than the ones of the 1985 bill. Jonathan mentioned working lands, which is an important transition away from set-aside programs. As these programs have matured, we've seen an evolution to what I think is a very important uh, part of the solution to our natural resource concerns. The concern of regulation for farmers is real. And the purpose of many USDA working lands programs is designed to help with those issues. So as it was already mentioned, the Environmental Quality Incentive Program, EQIP, is designed to assist producers in complying with local, state, and national regulatory requirements concerning soil, water, air, wildlife, surface, and groundwater conservation and to avoid the need for resource and regulatory programs by assisting in protecting soil, water, and air and related natural resources. So, as this focus of assisting in complying with and better yet helping to avoid the need for regu regulation uh, is important, focusing conservation programs on solving problems and preventing problems in the first place, um, instead of doing just what's known as random acts of conservation, I think is one of those things that we really need to focus on. An important step, I think, in the 14 bill was the creation of the Regional Conservation Partnership Program. When we look at the new approach of focusing on specific, specific resource concerns in specific regions and concentrating on solutions rather than just putting practices on the ground, so, the 
additional part of RCP that I think is really innovative is that we're leveraging. When we look at the place-based approach and we look at the buy-in from local communities, we see an ability to maximize the number of participants along with assisting NRCS in solving those natural resource concerns. RCPP also looks to promote innovative projects that integrate multiple conservation approaches to deliver comprehensive and measurable results. So the program looks for participants not just on one practice or program, but looks at that suite of solutions, both inside and outside of USDA. Initiatives like the Greater Sage Grouse Initiative and the RCPP program can be a model for solving these comprehensive water quality problems in multiple regions nationally across the entire breadth of our country. So specific practices needed for each situation will be different. In Western Lake Erie, the focus on dissolved reactive phosphorus, as we've talked about, without cost, uh, without Farm Bill cost share programs that focus on these best management practices and nutrient management, with also this infield monitoring, we get to that infield nutrient management that the producer then has confidence in. So as was already mentioned, a, a more collaborative approach focusing on partnerships will also make uh, lasting cultural change. The ability to, uh, for example, the 4R concept of applying nutrients at the right time, in the right place, the right type of nutrient, and the right source is an example of that industry-led approach that can produce considerable results. Outreach and education from private partners also is an incredibly important part to tell in the story of the judicious use of nutrients. This collaborative approach will also be important in avo avoiding duplication of effort. We must remember that the beneficial effect of these types of practices take time. So one such example is the goal to increase organic matter in the soil and this soil health partnership and renaissance that, that is occurring. Increased organic matter by just one percentage point can take many, many years. But when technical assistance is provided to a producer, and I, I think a couple of things that were already mentioned, everything we're talking about as we're working on the farm is a, is a management decision and within a business model that has to be recognized. So that return, though, for one percentage point of increased or ma organic matter can hold an extra inch of rain, which, as we saw in 2012, can be extremely valuable when a drought, one of those variables that we don't have control over. So voluntary incentive-based conservation is moving into an exciting time of change and evolution. Precision agriculture, and I'd like to say even precision conservation activities and new technologies should be integrated into what we, the conservation community, like to call that precision conservation type of a, a, an outreach. Technological advances should play a major role in preventing nutrient loss, and we look forward to, to further research and adoption within the agricultural community. You know, I think as we listened to our panel this afternoon, we heard a number of different things. We heard about how there is an interest for stewardship. I think that it is, uh, it is fair to say that there were also discussions of the regulatory component, a, a regulatory backstop in place as, as uh, we know in the uh, uh, analogy to a, a baseball game is important. But with regulation, we get 
potentially compliance with incentive programs and with technical assistance, thinking about it from not only the component of the environmental outcome, but also of the importance to maintain that business profitability. Because we have to remember in working lands, which are the majority of those acres that we're talking about, there is a necessity for a profitability aspect there. With incentives and with the right technical assistance, we get stewardship, which is exponentially better than just potentially compliance. So I think that as we look at these new opportunities and as we look at the Regional Conservation Partnership Program, we've got non-traditional partners that are coming to the table with ideas, with influence, with networks, and also with financial resources, which help us to achieve those outcomes that we all as a society desire. So excited about the opportunities that are right in front of us. It will take a collaborative approach to getting to those outcomes though. And first and foremost, we need to think about, as was already stated, how do we collaborate with farmers that have multiple decisions that many times are at the mercy of a very erratic, I think we can say, and at times very um, harsh uh, climate? How can we put in place different policies, different incentives that really help them to make it through and to, and to weather that storm, pardon the pun, so that we can get to those uh, societal goals that we have? So with that, I will leave time for question and answer. Thank you. Thank you, John, for that uh, overview of all of these different issues. So we have a few minutes now, about 15 minutes for question and answer, and we have a microphone. So if we could wait until you receive the mic, because we have a lot of, I know we have people watching remotely um, before you ask your question, but with that, we'll open up to question and answer. Uh, right here. Right down in front. <laughs> Hey, uh, Adam, can you say a little bit about the research program? What are the uh, top research gaps that uh, you're working with OSU and ARS on to resolve to help farmers do a better job? Yeah, efficiency is going to be one of the biggest ones. If you're, if you're thinking about the tight system you're managing within, given all these weather variables and other types of conditions, you know, if you, if you fill a cup with – Phosphorus, you know, about one pound of phosphorus would fit in this cup. And now you're talking about an acre of ground the size of a football field. And right now, some of the data is suggesting that if you modify your application of phosphorus within a pound per acre, that might make significant difference depending on weather conditions in a given year. That is, we're talking, as, as Leon said, we're, we're getting very prescriptive of how farmers and how tight we're managing our resources. So what are those very specific practices within a system that dynamic uh, that we need to understand as farmers to be able uh, to manage just that pound, if you will, right, or that application rate that we're, that we're applying? So uh, there are gaps uh, there are a series of gaps. This project was actually looking at uh, the one. I, one of the ones I mentioned uh, is uh, is looking at just that surface and subsurface. Uh, what's happening with dissolved reactive phosphorus? But other gaps. A, a terrific gap is this question that came up with one of our OSU scientists who said, "You know, we had this terrific uh, uh, advancement in in dealing with acid rain, uh, and uh, the Clean Air Act has vastly reduced acid rain." Uh, and what falls on Ohio is worth about 20 pounds of phosphorus per acre of what used to fall out of the sky onto our farm fields. That no longer happens just in the last 20 years. That's changed. Well, what, does that ha what does that do to the, to the pH balance of our soil? This OSU scientist took data back the last 20 years and showed an actual shift in pH balance in the northwestern part of our state because of cleaner air. Uh, well, who would have thought of that? 
Um, now, you know, again, we got to manage for that. So the farmer now has to manage for that because phosphorus movement depends on pH balance in the soil. So that's that's one of those that's, a, that's one example of a gap. There's probably about 30 actually that we've listed of gaps uh, that we need to fill in order to make sure that when we're going to be prescribing practices and even recommending and discussing practices and practices that should be within these conservation uh, cost share programs, we want to make sure we're, we're saying the right things and recommending the right practice. So we got a lot of gaps to fill. Uh, down here in the purple. Hi, I've got a question for Adam about SB1. You mentioned that it restricts the application of fertilizer on frozen, saturated, or potentially saturated ground. Mm -hmm. How do you determine potentially saturated ground? What information goes into that, and how do you verify it afterwards? Yep. It's the weather forecast. So uh, it's rainfall amount uh, within the next 24 hours or 12 hours, whether or not it's fertilizer or manure, uh, and then it's for a half inch of rain or an inch of rain. So it's the, it's the prediction. Now, the reason why we developed the app uh, was to make sure that, as we know, 50% uh, prediction of rain, sometimes that means it rains and sometimes it doesn't. Um, so we wanted to make sure farmers were covered as well, right? So if you're doing the right thing and it says there's only a 10% chance of rain, uh, you now have an application that you can just punch a button and record. Uh, and this is the, the weather data is linked to, this is uh, uh, USGS and NOAA data. Uh, so it's link, linked to the federal, uh, federal weather predictable uh, model that they have, uh, which, which most of the weather services are based off of. It records that, that weather forecast for you right then, that day, that time. So you have that as protection. So if you get the 10% prediction and, you know, three hours later within that 24-hour window, you get an inch gusher, well, or a two-inch rainfall, that's not your fault. And you have now, you have the data. You, the farmer, did everything you could do to manage that nutrient. Uh, and you have the data to protect yourself. So, uh, uh, so that's how it's based. It's not an easy model to deal with. This is, uh, this, it's difficult stuff. Uh, but we think it's something that we're working with. And we'll see. It's, uh, it's brand new. Uh, so in the next several years, you can imagine there'll probably be a lot of tweaking on this. There'll be a lot of discussion about compliance or not uh, and how, we're, and how these, uh, uh, these methods are going to work. But uh, we're pretty confident in what's, what's been put together. We'll try to keep it as simple as possible uh, and then put in some of, these, some of these types of technology to help make sure uh, that farmers have the technology in their hand to know when to apply. And then when they do everything, Everything in their power, if something happens, like Mother Nature often does, uh, that you're not held accountable for that. Great. Uh, Bill Brandon, right behind you there. Uh, I have a general question, probably more for Leon and Adam, and this is, in general, the relationship of uh, renewable fuels and uh, 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 soil quality and nutrient retention, because my understanding is that with uh, the increased productivity, you also get increased productivity of uh, residues. In 1970, maybe it was two tons per acre for corn, and now it's like four tons per acre. And if you're not managing that through uh, landfilling, through uh, moldboard plowing, what are you doing with it? And is it, do you not have to remove it to do cover crops and that sort of stuff? Uh, what, what is the relationship there of your soil quality and, and this large amount of residues you were getting? Well, that, that is a good point of what we've been able to do with, um, as yields increase, you know, that, that amount of plant material increases. And that's a good thing because um, we've had some farms, for example, uh, uh, Let's see, John touched on uh, building soil organic matter, and that's an important component. And so that really helps us do that. We have a farm that we've raised the soil organic matter because we went eight years of continuous corn uh, to get that plant material. And um, where we're not using a moldboard, the moldboard plow where we clean plowed would kind of layer everything, okay? And that wasn't a good thing because it wouldn't really degrade or mix in or really help the soil health. And the tools that we have today now, um, it, it becomes more of a challenge, and, and different regions are different. Uh, uh, the soil types are different, so all that soil structure is different. Some places no-till works really well, and some places it just doesn't work as well. So we use reduced tillage, and for example, on our own farm, we've tried no-till. Uh, it just wasn't quite working for us. We weren't, weren't getting, we were starting to get a, some layering the other way. 
for what you just mentioned is yields increase. You start getting layering, okay, what are we going to do with that residue? And some of the folks with renewable, uh, that's where some of the cellulosic folks are looking at that maybe you can re remove a certain percentage, but you have to be careful there. Anything you remove, you're removing some nutrients. And it's like talked about and Adam touched on as far as you, we have to see what the nutrient levels are and keep everything in balance. And I think I touched on that as well. So we're finding with the new equipment technology that is doing a better job of mixing and, and the planting equipment is helping us plant into those residues, whether it's a cover crop residue, and I failed to mention we're working some with, with cover crops, mixed results yet for us, but the planting equipment will plant a good uh, seed and, and good placement and soil contact uh, into more residues than we ever used to do, than my dad's era ever did. So that help you? Excuse me, about a 5% increase in early germination that too much residue makes the soil too cold, insulates it too much, and affects germination. Uh, I don't know how you balance that into the situation and that sort of stuff. That actually is one of the, issue, one of the issues that we had in regards to no-till. We were uh, to get the soil warm up and to get, uh, uh, that was affecting um, when we could go in and plant and get a good seed bed or get a good seed bed for that seed to germinate. So that can be the case. But now really, and that's a hats off to all of the equipment manufacturers really have, we have things called trash whippers. Uh, and I, I don't like the name because we don't call it trash. It's residue because we use that. It's important to us. So Actually, while we're, we are seeing improvement, because over time, uh, even in no-till situations or in where we use a um, conservation tillage, why we get better mixing so you actually uh, get uh, soil warm-up can be a little better. And as well as keeping, you, don't, you aren't having the runoff. You're getting the, the any rainfall has a chance to, um, to soak in. And so you're also, um, when you plant, um, you aren't getting the, what we used to call, you know, it, it gets real as hard as this table and then the seed can't grow through it. We don't have near as many of those issues that we did at once upon a time either. So it's one of those things, it's a, a good question, but we've really been able to turn it into a positive. I just mentioned different cover crops too, right, for different practices. And depending on the farmer, depending on the operation, you can do all kinds of things with cover crops, but a lot of it's experimental, right? You're trying to figure out what's gonna work for your farm, uh, your situation. Um, with, with residue, uh, one of the things we do, for example, we have a dairy as well in our, as part of our farm. And uh, in some of our cover crop fields, we'll actually bale it. So we'll mow it off and bale it so we get the benefit of having that growing crop out there all winter long. And the spring comes along, we'll actually mow it off, bale it, and feed it to the cattle. Uh, so we'll get another benefit, if you will, out of the cover crop. So uh, it depends on the farm. There's a lot of, different, a lot of different types of cover crops for lots of different types of reasons. Great. Any, any other questions? Uh, down in the suit, in the blue jacket. A uh, question for Lynn. Uh, my name's Alan Kovsky from Bloomberg. Uh, you mentioned uh, being able to avoid using pesticides to deal with crone rootworm. Uh, what was the solution? What, what are you using that prevents the crone rootworm? It's a biotech solution. So it's a, G I don't like the term, but a GMO event that we're a actually able to get the rootworm protection. That's a better protection too, because it does several things for us. It, it protects the seed without the chemical, like I mentioned, but also a thing that is, was important with eliminating that class of chemicals is before that chemical we were using, um, you know, they aren't, they don't target just the rootworm, the pest. I mean, it kills pretty much everything in that zone around the seed. And with the biotech event, they are so site specific that they control what we need to control, in this case, the rootworm. The other microbials, all everything in the soil uh, is not affected. So that's a real plus of what this new technology is able to do the problem that in reality isn't talked about near, near enough because people need to understand that aspect as well. Great. I think there is a question behind this gentleman. Hey, I'm Robin Shane from the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, first of all, thank you all for your efforts in uh, recognizing the responsibility of, of, of agriculture uh, for the environment and water quality. Um, I think that science has a lot to offer, and, um, and I missed the beginning of your talk, Jonathan, but I see that you have 
had had a slide of many different um, conservation tools and with different degree of uh, ability to manage nutrient loss. My question is really one of, of numbers. I mean, in Ohio, they're, they're calling for a 40% reduction, elsewhere 45. Um, and some, some of these methods, like wetlands or, or uh, bioreactors, I mean, what penetration is there in, you know, even cover crops? I've heard it said, you know, how many people are doing cover crops? Oh, about 5% of farmers. How are you going to get to the, how are you really going to get to those numbers that you need? Is it, and I'm not saying regulation, but maybe policy. Um, I mean, obviously, NRCS with the partnerships, the regional partnerships, that's a, a step in the right direction. But I know markets determine the prices of things. Um, you know, what tools are needed to get everybody on board to, to really solve the problem? Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's the big question, right? That's, it is complex. I mean, just listening across the conversation today, you've got a whole host of different, what might work on one farm this year won't work on the same farm next year. And so the complexity of it is key. I think, you know, the science, uh, continuing the, the, the investment that we're doing through conservation programs. But at the end of the day, a lot of what we're looking at is, you know, how are you thinking of conservation the way the farmer is thinking of farming? So things like technology, this precision technology, the capabilities we have in the cabs right now, uh, on the laptops and the iPads, you know, trying to find ways to get that uh, more focused on conservation and on helping sort out these practices. And then the business management. What are the economics of this? How do we address those economics and help the farmer manage through additional complexity, in some cases with cover crops and other practices, additional risk, and kind of combine those up? And so I... You know, I think there's a, this is a long-running effort, and we're not gonna, you're not going to turn it around in, in, a, in a year or two, but you begin to work through those issues. And I, you know, I tend to think that each one of those is going to drive the need for more research, more science, more understanding of what's going on in each field, across the regions, across multiple fields in these watersheds. And it's just a building effort, and we're seeing it. And I think you see you know, a lot of farmers taking it very seriously throughout uh, the Midwest and, and trying to come up with solutions, and we see more and more companies and interest groups, uh, universities trying to dig deeper and deeper into this to try to find a way to help resolve the issues. And so it's a building process and it's, it's going to take time, but there's a lot of tools out there that we can use. If I might add to that, um, the, the Soil Health Partnership is, is, that's kind of the objective and that's why I, I'm involved because on the farm, you Illinois, for example, is a very diverse state as you go from north to south, as, let alone clear across the Midwest or across the corn-growing regions of the country. So what works in one area doesn't work so well in another. And, you, and so the Soil Health Partnership, for example, I'm part of that, and we're doing that on a 50-acre uh, plot of, of our land, and we're able to use our technologies to track what we're, where we're seeing improvement. But m more than that, it's getting those initiatives into the neighborhoods. For example, me in central Illinois uh, is a lot different. Uh, it doesn't matter what maybe the university research farm said uh, in southern Illinois where they had a station working on cover crops. So you can see, my neighbors can see what we're doing and we have little machine shed meetings and so they can come see, okay, this worked or quite frankly, a year ago, nothing worked. We weren't, uh, because of the way the, the weather was, we didn't get it established. So you have to be a little careful with how expensive a cover crop you look at because there, we're still kind of in that learning mode that maybe it's working, maybe not. But, but to your point, we're learning that as we go in these areas. And what I was trying last year, now all of a sudden we had three folks around us that are, are doing it. Some are flying things on, some are, you know, there's a lot of things happening and it's, it's kind of learning watching the neighborhood and then having those type of meetings to, to share information. And, and it takes some effort by, uh, for example, Soil Health Partnership, I think I mentioned includes uh, state gro corn grower associations as well as national corn, but, but also um, Environmental Defense Fund is involved somewhat. Uh, people like Walton Foundation, the seed industry is, Monsanto and DuPont. So. Um, there's a, and that is how we're going to do it. And like Jonathan said, it's not going to be an overnight deal because uh, we're look, looking at expense. We're looking at, okay, what happens with that cover crop, crop to uh, the insects in my soil, right? So if I go start using a cereal rye, for example, am I going to increase um, the wireworm pressure? 
So is that going to be a problem that then I'm going to have to address? So there are a whole host of things that we're going to have to go through. And, and, I, and I'm glad that you folks are here to see that this, there's no easy answer to this deal, right? But we are trying a lot of different things, and that's how we're going to collectively come up with solutions to continue to improve. Okay, great. Unfortunately, I think we're out of time. If you have additional questions, our panelists, I'm sure, will be more than happy to talk to you individually. We should have the video online very soon in the next couple of days. And please join me in thanking our panelists today. Thank you.